Yeah, so um, I study the hematopathic system, which is the blood forming system. Uh, so all cells in our, uh, in our blood have a very limited lifespan. So some cells only live for uh, uh, a few hours. Some cells live for a few weeks. Uh, and therefore, every uh, day, billions of cells are produced uh, in the bone marrow. And so the, these blood-forming stem cells, hematopathic stem cells, they live in the bone marrow and they make sure that blood is continuously produced. Um, and so they are, uh, they are crucial, right? So if you, if you don't have hematopathic stem cells, then ultimately you will have no blood cells anymore and therefore that is not compatible with life. Um, and so where we're interested in, our, I guess the topic of our studies is how blood cell production is maintained um, during life. So, uh, you know, most of the time things fortunately go well uh, but also, uh, if you look in, uh, in a hospital and you look in patients that develop uh, hematological problems, typically they are much older, right, 65 years uh, or older. So we, we think that uh, these stem cells, these hematopathic stem cells that normally produce blood very carefully with age, um, gradually are getting worse and worse. Uh, and and, and produce fewer and fewer stem cells, and this leads to a loss of, uh, of blood cells into the circulation of, of older people. And so this is what we're interested in. And on the other hand, sometimes these cells, these hematopathic stem cells, they accumulate mutations because they divide very often. And so these mutations uh, are typically harmless, and then the cell dies. But now and then, of course, a mutation um, uh, is established that confers some kind of a proliferative advantage uh, to these hematopathic stem cells. And that typically then turns into, you know, a, let's say a leukemia. So also leukemias typically occur, or some of the leukemias typically occur only in older people. So that suggests that as an uh, accumulation of mutations that have happened throughout the lifespan of such a hematopathic stem cell, and ultimately that cell then uh, will uh, go out of control. So we are interested, I'm interested, my lab is interested in how these hematopathic stem cells maintain their proper function during life and make sure that they don't produce too few stem cells, too, too few blood cells, which is not good, and also make sure that they don't produce too many stem cells, uh, which is also not good because it results in blood cancers, which are leukemias. So that's my field. So I think the field of, of hematopoiesis, hematopoietic, uh, stem cells was, um, I'm not sure when it started, but for sure, um, like in the early 50s, uh, 60s, uh, people realized that if you radiate uh, an animal, uh, like say a mouse or a rat, uh, the radiation will <coughs> kill the blood forming stem cells in the bone marrow and the mouse or rat will die. And so people in the 50s, did crucial experiments where they took bone marrow from one mouse and transplanted that into another mouse that what had been irradiated. And they showed actually that the mouse, the irradiated mouse, now survived, right? And so there was a lot of discussion whether it, the cells that were transplanted, whether it would be the cells themselves that actually reestablished the hematopathic system or whether it would be secreted factors. Um, ultimately, both turned out to be the case, but it for sure, the field of stem cell transplantation, hematopathic stem cell uh, transplantation, bone marrow transplantation, originates from those days, like in the 50s or so. And so then in the 60s, there were various groups, including uh, a large group in Seattle, that uh, did this for the first time in patients. So patients that would develop leukemia, uh, and that would receive a very high dose of chemotherapy, uh, potentially sufficiently high to kill the leukemia, uh, but so high that it would also kill normal hematopoietic stem cells. So the patient would not be helped a lot because it, it, the patient would have lost all it, uh, or his or her hematopoietic stem cells. And so then the first uh, bone marrow transplantations were carried out, I think, in the 1960s or so.
uh, initially not so successful and, and gradually much more successfully so, so that now most hospitals do this for patients that develop leukemia. So bone marrow transplantation is really a stem cell therapy. It's the first clinically, I guess, approved stem cell therapy, right? So now days, of course, this field of stem cell biology goes into many other tissues uh, and organs. But I would say the origin of the field of stem cell biology uh, resides in the hematopoietic, in the blood forming system from treating patients with bone marrow cells, transplanted bone marrow cells. That, uh, and so then um, I think in the 60s people realized that, uh, that there are indeed these stem cells. This was seminal work done in, uh, by Tilla McCulloch in Toronto, realizing that there are single cells that can produce all kinds of blood cells. So that the red blood cells, the platelets, and the white blood cells are actually all derived from a single hematopoietic stem cell. And I think then an important contribution was made by various labs that they could purify these cells. So it was not just bone marrow, it was very mixed. There's very different types of cells in the bone marrow. And so then, like I would say probably in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, people purified these hematopoietic stem cells and showed that ultimately at a single cell level, they transplanted one cell to a mouse in which the hematopoietic system had been destroyed. And that single cell was able to reestablish the blood forming system after transplant in the recipient. So that was all very descriptive. I think in the last, um, I would say, you know, 15 years or so, we know which are the genes that contribute, that are essential for, for stem cells, right? So we know now a lot about how these stem cells reproduce themselves and which genes transcription factors are important to maintain stem cell activity. Um, so it's a, it's a very exciting field. I guess at this point, the only, uh, the only, uh, clinical application of, of, uh, of hematopoietic stem cells is in bone marrow transplantations, but there's, I think, emerging, uh, uh, that that field is broadening, for example, in gene therapy, right? So where, for example, you have a patient which has a defect in a gene which, uh, which causes, uh, you know, uh, 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 hemophilia, so there's no clotting of blood, or there's, uh, you know, no immune cells, or there's sickle cell anemia, or the thalassemia, so these are, uh, 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 in these patients, there are problems with red blood cells. Uh, so these patients can be cured either by a bone marrow, they have a genetic disease, and so they can be cured potentially by a bone marrow transplantation from someone else, but more um, uh, elegant and more efficient, you would think, is to take bone marrow cells, hematopoietic stem cells from the bone marrow from these patients, and introduce the correct gene that is defect in these, in these stem cells. Um, and that can be done. And then you transplant the corrected stem cells back into the patient. Uh, and so this is, I think, uh, uh, you know, where stem cell biology and gene therapy meet. Um, and we see now for the first time very successful clinical trials where particularly young kids with very serious uh, diseases have been cured uh, by these corrected autologous, you know, patient-owned autologous uh, corrected hematopoietic stem cells. So I think this is uh, a, a very exciting uh, time. Uh, what so far, you know, where the field, what the field tries to do is to establish hematopoietic or blood-forming stem cells from other tissues, for example, embryonic or induced pluripotent stem cells, or even from fibroblasts. I mean, this is very experimental yet uh, at this point, but I think it's very conceivable that, uh, let's say, within the next uh, 10 years or so, uh, we, we can actually produce, generate hematopoietic stem cells from, uh, from other cells uh, for, clinical, uh, for clinical purposes. I would say the major challenge in the field of in the clinical field of hematopoietic stem cell uh, biology is that it has been impossible to uh, start with one stem cell, one hematopoietic stem cell, and produce many of them, right? So in, in vivo, if you transplant them, they can do that, and we know this from, from mouse studies, right? Again, you can transplant a single stem cell into a mouse, and all blood cells are made, and the mouse is fine. Uh, so these cells can do that, but to do that in vitro, so outside of the body, has become very difficult, or has been impossible. 
right? So it has been impossible to take hematopoietic stem cells, put them in a dish, add growth factors, and then multiply them so that you have many more, and transplant those. And so for some of these clinical applications, that act would actually be very good. Uh, uh, for example, um, there is also hematopoietic stem cells in cord blood. So if, the babies, if babies are delivered, um, then in the cord that is normally thrown away, trashed, there are many uh, hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, but of course, it's a very limited volume of blood that you can drive from one cord. So if you were to, but, but these cells are very potent. So if you were able to isolate these cells and expand them to large numbers, uh, that would actually be a very good source for hematopoietic stem cell uh, applications. But it's, it's a limited number. So stem cell expansion, I think, is a, is a very important aspect. And the second, I think, very interesting uh, line of research is not so much stem cell biology, but attempts to generate red blood cells or blood platelets, erythrocytes and thrombocytes, outside of our body for transfusion purposes. Right? So now, let's say if you have to undergo a major surgery and you need red blood cell infusions, the red blood cells are donated by someone, right? blood banks collecting red blood cells uh, from donors that they transfuse into patients. But it's very possible, ultimately, that we could also generate those cells ex vivo, let's say, in potentially bioreactors, right, where you have just a lot of cell proliferation going on and cell renewal going on, and then ultimately differentiate these cells out into platelets and red blood cells. And so there's a lot of current uh, research activities of various groups that try to generate, you know, mature blood cells, red blood cells, and blood platelets from outside of the body, ex vivo, uh, from hematopoietic stem cells. So I think that would be uh, a major breakthrough if we could ultimately achieve that.